Hello, this is Mr. Seymour and welcome to our first video lesson. Uh, the uh, video lecture today is going to be on political thinking and political culture, becoming a responsible citizen. So we're going to start with the uh, concepts of exactly why we study government and what government is, but also why it's important. So uh, the next slide is going to have a video and then we're going to get into our lesson and um, take notes and make sure you read chapter one. This election will determine the future of our country. And this election will be determined by the undecided voter. It seems that more than 96% of voters have already made up their minds about this election. Well, I guess some of us are just a little bit harder to please. We're not impressed by political spin or 30 second sound bites. Before you get our vote, you're going to have to answer some questions. Questions like, When is the election? How soon do we have to decide? What are the names of the two people running? And be specific. Who is the president right now? Is he or she running? Because if so, experience is maybe something we should consider. How long is a president's term of office? One year? Two years? Three years? Or life? If it's for life, frankly, we're not comfortable with that. We don't need to be electing a dictator. What happens if the president dies? Has anyone thought about who would replace him? What's your plan, gentlemen? Can women vote? Because if not, as a woman, I've got a big problem with that. And by the way, if men can't vote, in my opinion, that's just as wrong. We hear a lot about our dependence on foreign oil, but just what is oil? What is it used for? Can a woman have a baby just from French kissing? If you burp, fart, and sneeze at the same time, will you die? Where's my power cord? We are America's undecided voters. There's still a lot we don't know. And we, we want, want answers. answers. Low Information Voters of America is responsible for the content of this advertising. Is the video that we just saw an example of the extent to which most Americans understand politics? Is this the level of our political knowledge? This chapter is going to investigate the topic of political knowledge and we're going to look at the current environment that we live in as far as our understanding of politics and the relevance of political knowledge. Political thinking involves carefully gathering and sifting information to form a knowledgeable view about a political issue. And it is keystone, it's very important, to responsible citizenship. The video we saw, does that really model the level of political thinking that we as Americans really should be engaging in? Uh, or obviously this is from Saturday Night Live, is this an over-exaggeration? There are some barriers to political thinking, with the main barrier being an unwillingness of the citizen to make an effort to be self-informed. We live in a world where we are bombarded with media. We have more information available to us now than ever before. The internet, to pun things, has changed everything. Changes in media consumption, more people are consuming biased media from cable television, from internet blogs, and then political leaders use what we call spin to influence uh, how people think and how leaders think about ma in making decisions. The research shows that faulty perceptions and faulty information are becoming more prevalent in political decision making. So how can we as political scientists make a change or an influence in this problem? Well, political science is the systematic study of government and politics. This science involves both a descriptive and an analytical discipline. We want to look at what's happening write it and describe it, but we also want to measure, measure not just political polls, 
but also uh, researching and observing and recording information about exactly what's happening, uh, especially during a political cycle. And this can increase our ability to think politically because we now know where the pitfalls are, where the disadvantages and the advantages of our system are. As we look at ourselves as Americans, we always talk about a political culture that is based on a set of enduring beliefs, the American dream. And political culture can be derived from a variety of sources. It can be derived from a country's traditions, and the United States certainly has a mixture of traditions. We are more than just one country. We are more than just a melting pot. We are a stew pot of all kinds of cultures and traditions all mixed together. We don't just jump into a blender and become an American. We, we have to live together with different views. And America, but we do have a set of core ideals. And America's core ideals are rooted in a European heritage that was brought over by white settlers in 1602 and in 1620 when um, Plymouth and when Jamestown were settled. There are four core political values, the values of liberty, individualism, equality, and self-government that tend to be the, the roots of our constitutional democracy and the way we think politically. So we're gonna look at those. Now liberty is the belief that individuals should be free to act as they choose. Um, we believe that if there's land available, anybody should be able to go and get it. Unsettled land fostered freedom through migration. People came here to, to find wide open spaces. Many fled Europe to escape religious persecution, but American history is full of examples where uh, we welcomed the white northern and southern Europeans, yet Asians and Hispanics were not as welcomed. And we still tend to see a lot of that type of attitude today. We have a us and them and white European based uh, Americans tend to see themselves as the us and they see Asians uh, people from the Middle East, people from Mexico as the them. And that's really not something that should be in the core value of our American culture, but it is. Now, individualism is part of the reason for this. Individualism says that the individual is paramount and government is secondary. The government's role should be to serve the people, not control the people. Uh, back in the 1770s, right after we started as a country, Alexis de Tocqueville came to observe our form of democracy, to see this experiment in action. And he wrote a book, and in that book he said, in his observations, that the Americans' chief aim is to remain their own masters. We don't want anybody telling us what to do individually, or in our groups, in our states, or as a nation. Now equality comes from the reaction to the European aristocratic privilege system. In America, we believe we're all, we all should be on equal footing. All men are created equal. We believe in equal treatment under the law. But this is a perplex, perplexing ideal in the early years of our nation because some were free, some were slaved, and some were indentured where they had sold themselves into slavery. And then once they worked their way out, they became free citizens. So there, these differing opinions on what equality really means still persist today. Like if you take the views of Thomas Jefferson uh, about equality, he had slaves. George Washington had slaves. So when Thomas Jefferson wrote that all men are created equal, did he really 
in his heart mean all white men or did he mean all men? That becomes a question. The belief in self-government, the American colonials had substantially a large amount of self-government and self-determination. We had a 3,000 mile separation from Mother England and we were accustomed to being by ourselves. And I like to always say that the American Revolution was very much like a teenage hissy fit. Once a teenager hits 14, 15, 16, they want their independence. They'll slam the door. They'll say, this is my room, stay out. And that's almost the way that it was for us as Americans. Now that's not to say that the American Revolution wasn't an important part of American history and that we shouldn't be proud of it. But what we should understand is we are very self-governing and we insist on self-government. The vision of self-government of a self-government nation with powers that derive from the consent of the governed as the American uh, Declaration of Independence says, um, these core political values still remain in the United States today, but they also cause great conflict between the way that some people believe on one side where they believe the government should have a lot larger say in the lives of Americans in order to provide the goods and services, uh, public goods and services that we need uh, and depend upon versus those of us that say, those that say, um, I am my own person, I pull myself up from my bootstraps, I take care of myself. And in some cases, uh, I've heard it said, it's great to say to pull yourself up from the bootstraps, but will you at least give me a pair of boots? Is that the role of the government to give us that pair of boots? Or do we have to go find the boots as well? So there are limits and uh, on the power of America. America's cultural beliefs are idealistic. They're idealistic, and that means that they're hard or impossible to attain in their entirety. We see historical examples of failures in our ideals. For instance, we've never been a truly equal society even today. Um, slavery existed. Post-slavery Jim Crow laws existed that limited the rights of certain individuals of race or color. And we still today see racial immigration and property restrictions. All you have to think about right now is Donald Trump and his statement that uh, they, meaning Hispanics coming from Mexico, are all rapists and thieves and they're coming into the United States to take our jobs. That's a very broad statement about a group of people and a big misunderstanding about the culture that exists on the other side of the border. So what is an American? What is the we and the they? That becomes one of the things we need to look at as we examine political culture and where we are today. These are very enduring questions that are rising themselves up today in the in the political debates that we see as we go into the presidential uh, process. High ideals also, we look at abolition and suffrage movements. Ending slavery was something that happened from the beginning of this nation. And of course, we, we fought a civil war over this. Uh, emancipation, the freeing of the slaves. People don't realize it, but um, uh, President Lincoln did not actually free all slaves. He freed slaves in the South through the Emancipation Proclamation, which was a presidential order. The Civil Rights Movement, where uh, African Americans took it upon themselves to demand their civil rights, their right to vote, and equal treatment. We're going to look at that in this course. Public education. Nowhere in the Constitution does public education appear as a right, yet we depend upon the government to provide us with public education 
Is that the responsibility of government? What is the role of government with regard to public education? And the same for higher education. Is everyone entitled to a college education? President Obama a year or so uh, uh, proposed that every American student coming out of high school should have the ability to get a free two-year college education before going on to four-year university. The first two years of college would be free. Well, free is a relative term. Free costs somebody something, and that's why we haven't seen anything come of this yet. But uh, is higher education, as it was in the past, still today an elitist idea, or is it something that we see as almost uh, an inalienable or a right, something that can't be taken away from us? Because we know we need college education, higher education, and public education uh, to just survive in today's society. So. What's the role of government? So let's look at power and politics. Uh, politics is dis defined um, as the means by which society settles its conflicts and allocates the resulting benefits and costs. Now, there was a there's a political thinker by the name of Harold Laswell that says that politics is who gets what, when, and how and he takes a very economic stance. So politics um, is basically the processes by which we settle our conflicts and we allocate our, res our, our, our uh, resources and, our, our, and we pay the costs. And it's also the process by which we select our leaders and by which we make our decisions. The institutions that do those things then become what we look at as government. Now, power is the resource. Power is the ability of persons, groups, or institutions to influence a political development, meaning the acquisition of a resource or a political decision or uh, who's going to uh, be elected to an office or selected to a government job. All of that has to do with power, the ability to influence there are forms of government that tend to exert power and wield power unfairly or unjustly in American perspectives, and those are, would, would be defined as non-democratic, repressive regime types. And you can think Iran if you want to, which is more of a theocracy. You have to believe religiously what they believe, or you can also think about um, in the case of North Korea being a very repressive society, to some extent today still uh, a place like uh, Russia is more repressive in a lot of ways than the United States. But what exactly then is a democracy? We're going to look at what a democracy is a little bit later, but basically a democracy is a form of government where the people have a true say in the process. And the level to which people have a say of and have control uh, in their government will actually define the level of democracy that you have in a society. So let's look, though, at this trade-off between the services that governments provide and the cost, because the cost comes in terms of taxes. So you can see that in Sweden, they have a 45% tax rate, but they also have a tremendous amount of government programs, free education, free health care. But then it's not really free because everybody's paying. Now, in the United States, our tax rate is the lowest of all of these Western nations that you see here at 25%. And the reason is because we have that individualistic trade-off that says, you know what, we don't want to give all our money to the government and say, government, we depend on you to provide us with these, these um, resources. We tend to say, look, we're going to fund our military. We're going to look at our purposes of government in the way that the founders of the Constitution did. But also, we want independence and we want the ability to make our own decisions, both politically and economically. So that's what this chart really means, is uh, the higher the tax rate, the more that you're going to have government services, because those government services cost. And the more you'll probably have government involved 
in the in the um, the daily lives of the citizens. So let's look here at the percentage of people that uh, obtain a college degree. Uh, they show you this chart in the book. Um, states like California, Washington, Utah, Colorado, Kansas, Minnesota, Illinois, New York, most of your northeastern states, and Virginia have a 30% or higher rate of people getting college degrees. Texas is uh, kind of tier two here at 25 to 29.9%. But if you look at the three states that have less than 20%, they're, they're, most, they're all in the south, and they tend to be uh, lower in economic status. And those are Arkansas, Mississippi, and West Virginia. All right. Now the green states are one step above. That would be Nevada, Wyoming, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, Indiana, Iowa, and South Carolina and Maine. And with the exception of maybe Maine, most of those are either Midwest or Southern states that have a lot of uh, a high degree of independence and individuality and say, hey, you want to go to college? You do it yourself. You go on your own. Also, they tend to be very agrarian states, states that tend to depend upon a lot of agriculture. So they've never had a big uh, demand for higher levels of college education, but that's changing. So let us compare three systems uh, of, of government and political power. Uh, the, in democracy, it's a system of, and I'm going to highlight a few things here. It is a system of, it is a system of majority rule, meaning the tradition is people vote, whoever, want, whoever gets the most votes makes the decision by way of elections, which empower majorities those that get the most votes or the most support. And your author is going to talk about this as the problem of majoritarianism. And groups, which we call pluralism. And officials, which we will call here authority, those in authority, or what we'll later talk about as being bureaucracy and elitism. Now, the, pro the thing about democracy is that it's a system where the people, and this is important, so you need to write this down in your notes and remember this throughout the course. Democracy means the people have a say in their government. It does not mean majority rules. It does not mean majority rules. It means the people have a say in their government and then there are levels of democracy that you will see. Now a constitutional system is a system that is based on the rule of law, meaning that we abide by a set of standard rules and practices that tell us how we should behave in society, and we apply those equally and fairly. And the, those standards include legal protections for individuals, with the empowerment of individuals by allowing them to claim their rights in court by way of legal action. That means the right to bring a lawsuit, defend yourself in a lawsuit. Uh, that means the right to defend yourself with a lot of protections if you're accused of a crime. Then the last thing that you need to understand is we're also a free market system in this country. And by being a free market system, that means that we have an economic system. So this is economic. We have an economic system that centers on transactions between private parties and it allows business firms, which means we do give consideration to corporations and we give them power. And it also favors the wealthy. But we are a com consumer society and we, are, uh, we believe in free market economies where the seller and the buyer are free to come together with few restrictions to determine the price at which something will be sold and purchased and the value, the value of our money, the value of our goods and services. They are 
generally open to a free market that allows for the determination. We call that laissez-faire. We call that laissez-faire. And that means leave it alone. Leave it alone. Meaning the government should stay out. Okay? Let's move forward. A democratic system is a system where people govern, the people govern by direct or representative means. And in practice, that means majority rule through free and open elections. But we have representative democracy in the United States because direct democracy would mean we're involved in every decision all the time and that's impractical. So we have a representative democracy, meaning you elect someone who makes that decision for you, but you select the person to make the decision. That becomes majoritarianism, which the, where the problem is that you have a majority that will effectively determine what government does, but then we have to make room for the minority. And uh, the, one of the fears of the founding fathers was something called the tyranny of the majority that they did not want to see happen. The tyranny of the majority. Now, pluralism refers to uh, groups or special interests, and we'll talk a lot about special interests in this course, which determine what the government does by way of influence. And authority is the recognized right of an official to exercise power. The recognized right to exercise power. In contrast with an authoritarian government, which is repressive. So an authoritarian government like North Korea is repressive. All the leaders have the power and the people have no power. Who has the power in this country? The people. Okay, they repress opposition through intimidation, the restriction of rights, and even imprisonment and physical abuse. And those things are our protections uh, from which we in America, uh, that's why we have the Bill of Rights, we wanted to protect people from those kinds of authoritarian behaviors. We have a constitutional system in the United States. The Constitution contains an elaborate set of checks and balances, meaning that we give a little bit of power to each of the three branches, our separation of, of powers. We give a little bit of power to the president. We give a little bit of power to the judiciary the, the uh, and a little bit of power to the legislative branch, the branch that makes laws, and they have power that they can exercise over each other in order to make sure that no one branch can go out of control. Also, we have protections between the people and the government by way of the Bill of Rights. Now, constitutionalism is the idea that there should be lawful restrictions on the power of government and restraints on the majority. And this is where this tyranny of the majority came in. So we have the idea of majority rule, minority rights. Majority rule, minority rights. So we always recognize the rights of the minorities and we try to give uh, uh, authority as much as possible to the majority who want something. But that doesn't mean that if you're in the minority that you are out of luck because we have a system in place that is supposed to protect minority rights. We'll talk more about that as we get into civil rights and civil liberties. Now, the judiciary, the, the courts, is the channel by which the ordinary citizen can exercise power and seek protection when the majority um, is um, restricting their individual rights.
Let's look at how litigious the United States is. Litigious means the number of lawyers and the number of courts we have. Uh, in the United States, we have 3.8 lawyers for every thousand people. France has 0.8, Great Britain 2.1. We have pretty much double what any other Western nation has. We love courts. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Remember, the reason we have the court system that we do is to protect the rights of the minority and to ensure that the laws are equally and fairly applied. However, that does not mean that we don't have too much court action, which is one of the debates. Is the court too powerful? Are we too litigious? Do we sue at everything? Our free market system says that, we op uh, that our economic system operates mainly in private transactions, some government intervention when it's necessary. And we do that through regulations, through taxation, and through our spending policies, which we call fiscal policy. And we'll talk more about that again later in the course. We tax at a much lower rate, a much lower rate in the United States than in Europe. And remember, the reason for that is in Europe, those taxes are going to all of those government services, free health care, free education. And people say, oh, look at uh, Europe. There's free health care and free education, but they're paying high taxes almost half of their income in some cases. Corporate power in the United States says that because of our free market society, we do have large corporations that tend to wield a lot of power and they have influence over lawmakers and policymakers by way of special interests. And this is becoming a question that leads us to the next, the next uh, definition here of elitism, which is saying that power is being exercised by a few which would be those that have money. And this is where you get the term, the one percenters. The one percenters saying that 1% of the population of the United States is, control of, is in control of a majority of the wealth in the United States. And they say, well, that's not fair. So then you talk about redistribution of wealth. But when you do that, then you're not in a democratic system. You're not in a free market system anymore. You're in, a, you're in more of a socialist or a communist system, depending. So who does govern? Um, the defining characteristics of American government and politics are that there is a widespread sharing of power. We don't want an oligarchy, which is a few people making all the decisions. We've tried to give opportunities for minorities, women, and now even uh, going into uh, sexual preference and considering that as a class. These people were initially excluded and their powers have grown over time, but only in the 20th and 21st century. So let's look a little bit about the organization of your text. The organization of your text is going to center around the constitutional system of government. The role of citizens and intermediaries, and that would be anything from our elected officials to our uh, uh, special interest groups. Um, corporations, the role of corporations, um, bureaucracies. Uh, these are all, these intermediaries, these are what we're looking at. The governing officials, the elective institutions and their appointed bodies are also something that we are going to look a lot at. And then we're going to look at public policy, which is the decisions that we make. And this book will focus, and my course will focus a lot on public policy. We're also going to focus on why effective government is difficult. It is difficult. It is difficult. Um, to quote, uh, to to um, to quote a famous leader, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others that have come before it. Democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others that have come 
before it. And that was Winston Churchill. Pardon me for having a small brain fart as I go through this lesson. Um, the focus is going to be on the difficulty of governing, and we're going to look at it in terms of effectiveness and how we still have to try. We still have to try. We can't just give up and say, well, that's it. Um, we just need to uh, say that our government doesn't work. We need to see how we can help and, and influence our government policy making. You guys are going to be the leaders in the future. You guys are going to be the ones that are going to be making that policy. And so I, I challenge you, I challenge you to look at this course as a way of saying, all right, this is my time to learn about how the world around me is going to work and how the decisions around me are going to be made. And am I going to be a part of those decisions or am I going to just allow things to happen to me? I challenge you to be an active and engaged partner in this process rather than just a passive observer and then um, having to, um, unfortunately, pay the price of a lack of participation. And that is the end of this lesson.